Awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heaven, we want to see you. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. Cause you're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're seen. see welcome 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 we're so glad you're here today the band has started us off right amen amen thank you so much y'all uh let me share with you some announcements so you know what's going on in the life of our church and find ways that you can get plugged into mission and ministry uh in bullard and the surrounding areas because we are not just a church in the community we're a church for the community and so help us to do that uh, in many and various ways. While I'm doing that, there's registration pads on the end of each row. There's offering baskets on the end of each row. Take those, pass them down. Give us the registration of your attendance. Give us some offering and uh, uh, to God, and, and we'll use that for His glory uh, in the days to come. Announcement-wise, uh, there will be no uh, Bible studies this week. Uh, so the Tuesday at 2 lectionary won't meet, and the Thursday at 2 uh, Bible, pastor Bible study won't meet as well. I will be uh, heading after church today uh, at noon. I'll be driving out to go to uh, the monastery in uh, Kentucky 
and uh, so I'll be gone for, for about a week there. I'll be back that following week on the Tuesday. Now, next Sunday, Nick Scholars is going to come and uh, be our guest preacher. Nick's been with us before. He does a great job, uh, and he'll lead us in communion uh, in both services next week as well. So uh, please be aware of that. Um, if there is a pastoral emergency, uh, Jeff Gage from Lane's Chapel said he'd be more than willing to be on call for us. So if you need to contact, uh, need to have a pastor uh, visit for emergency's sake, contact the church office. Venus will know how to get a hold of him uh, and can, can contact him for you. Uh, let's see, things going on. Club 118 today, that is for our, uh, our younger kids. They'll meet at the Walker's Home. It's fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. Are y'all ready for it, Walkers? Woohoo! Oh, you're cleaning after church. So you will be ready for it. Okay, you will be ready for it. Awesome. Okay, so mission meeting today, Harper Hall, right after our second worship service. Uh, so if you can be there, uh, come back at noon if you're interested in missions and outreach and serving in our community. Uh, please be uh, available for that. And there's other things in here, but I'll just highlight a couple of dates. You make sure you get them on your calendar. Our Easter explosion is going to be Saturday, April 9th at 9 a.m. This is a, one of our all hands on decks, large uh, outreaches into our community. Uh, there's going to be a lot going on to get ready for that. I'm sure they're needing candy and eggs and all kinds of good stuff, uh, but there's information in there about that. And Vacation Bible School is another one of our huge outreaches. Uh, we try to do VBS on steroids around here, and uh, so that'll be June 13th through 16th, 9 to noon each day that week. I think that's all the announcements we have. Anybody else have one? If not, then let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord. Sometimes I find there's a fork in the road. Should I stay? Should I try to climb higher? To do what I'm made for, to know the Good Shepherd, to breathe in the air of the mountain, fill my lungs with the air of the mountain. You my holy God, my vision in the heights, miles and miles high, I don't see you getting tired, oh, good shepherd, I follow The pain is my strength, you're my eyes, you're the way you give grace to my faith, so I'm climbing. You give strength to my day, so I'm climbing. You give strength, you give strength to my day, so I'm climbing. You are my holy guide, my vision. Miles and miles high, I 
I don't see you getting tired Oh, good shepherd You're faithful to take the lead. The way may be long, may be wild, but I know you're with me. I know you're with me. I know. for me anymore even broken feet could not keep me from seeking the one who faced death out of love for me he said follow me so I'm following oh the foothills are no place for me anymore even broken feet could not said, follow me, so I'm following, you said, follow me, so I'm following, oh, good shepherd, I follow where you need, cause your steps have tested the strength of Oh, good shepherd, you're faithful to take the lead. The way may be long, may be wild, but I know you're with me. The way Shepherd, 
You're faithful to take the lead. The way may be long, may be wild, but I know, God, you're with me. Oh, my way. took a breath before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you've been so kind you have been so
There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb. There's no wall you won't kick down. so much more than I can see greater than the host against me you are so much more than I can be so God let your kingdom come For I know the plans you have for me Plans to mold me and remake me So God, you can have all of me Cause your promise is enough He is on Oh, you are an honest God. Yeah, you are an honest God. Yeah, you are an honest God. Your words, they never fail. Your words, they never fail.
Done like man you said that you won't leave Closer than a friend you stay with me Through the years you're never changing You never failed, you never so much for today. God, thank you that we have this opportunity to be here together and to be with you. Thank you for your presence, for always showing up. You're always with us. Thank you so much. God, as we continue this morning, God, speak to us. Turn our eyes upon you. Open our hearts to hear your word. We love you with all of our heart. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Remain standing with me, if you will. We're going to have our scripture reading. It comes from Luke chapter 15, first three verses, and then we'll skip down to uh, verse 11 there. So let's begin. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a young man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. 
and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, uh, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went to and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomachs with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And are, here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went, on his, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near he, the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because uh, he, has found, uh, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and, ple and pleaded with him. But, the, but he answered the father, look. All of these years I've been slaving away from you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat as to celebrate with my friends. But when the, this son of yours, who was, has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother's, uh, brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. How many of you know the term clickbait? Raise your hand. Most of us know what clickbait is, especially if we've been on social media for any length of time. Clickbait is a, is a fairly new term that has come with the advent of, of social media, and it has to do with content that comes across our social media platforms, whether it be uh, uh, Twitter or, or, or it can be Facebook or things like that, uh, whose main purpose is to attract your attention and to get you to click on the link for a particular web page. And they do it, uh, that page that you go to typically is filled with a completely worthless article of some sort. It doesn't give you any information really at all. All they really want you to do is to, to look at all the bazillion advertisements they have around that, that silly worthless article around. That's one of the ways that, that clickbait works. And they, they call it clickbait because there's a title, a catchy title that, that is seen that, that really kind of grabs people's attention. For example, it might be a title like 10 Things Every Parent Must Know About Kids Today. And then they add something like, and number nine will shock you. You know, and you're, oh, well, I need to know about my kids. And so you click it. And, or or before, you, before you renew your Prime subscription, you need to know this. Click here. You know, oh, well, I've done about time to renew my prime subscription i need to know so you click it or or, or how i made a million dollars you can too click this link you know and and sometimes the link isn't necessarily even to a bad article with advertisements sometimes it's a phishing scam or or where they're trying to get information out of you or or send you to some malware or, or something along those lines or or maybe you you find a link that says Five things you need to know about Bullard First United Methodist Church. And number three will blow you away. You know, that, that's, that's clickbait. And, and, and some of you are probably going, well, I didn't know that was clickbait. I was just clicking, you know. Well, today in the story, 
that we know commonly as the story of the prodigal son. I wanted to be, I thought, well, let's just do something clever with it. Let's turn it into a clickbait story, okay? So we're going to turn this into a clickbait story, and the title for this clickbait story is this. Five things you may not know about the story of the prodigal son, and number four will shock you. Okay, most of us know the story of the prodigal son. But there's things about the culture, there's things about the, the, the context that really bring out uh, the depth and meaning in this story when we take time to really look at it. So, with that in mind, let's begin our clickbait list. Uh, you've clicked the link, now you're following on, here's your list that you get. Number one. What you need to know about the prodigal son story is what it mean, what it meant for the son to ask his father for his inheritance early. Now, when our inheritance is given out, after somebody dies, right? And you have a, a, you know, a, a judge or, or a, a minister of the will or someone who has responsibility for that sort of thing, and they sit down and, and, they, uh, uh, and they do those kinds of things. Now, a father giving his son an inheritance... You know, that happens today. It also happened back then. They would divide up the cattle. They would, and, and, and uh, they would divide up the sheep or they divide up the goats, whatever animals they had. They divide up the property. They would the land, whatever it may be. All those kinds of things that are involved in inheritance, that would, would be. And sometimes they would go and just sell that all and, and get the money and, and then divide that out, uh, kind of like what they might do today with an inheritance situation. But uh, it wasn't uncommon uh, that this would take place. And it wasn't uncommon that they had their own version of a will that would designate who gets what and, and how things were to be divided. Um, but like we said, an inheritance is normally given when a person dies. Now, is the father dead in the story? No. But what is the message the son is saying to the father when he asked for his inheritance early. Basically what he's saying to him. Is you're dead to me. To ask your, for your inheritance early. For that son to look his father in the eye. With a straight face and say. I want my inheritance now. Is the same equivalent. Of looking him in the eye and saying. You're dead to me. Give me what's mine. Was it his? No. But did the father give it? Yes. Was the son deserving? No. But did the father give it? Yes. Wow. That's powerful when you begin to understand the magnitude of disrespect, uh, 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 of selfishness, uh, 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 of, of ego-driven self-centeredness, that his needs were more important than his father's. That, that what mattered to him was most important. And to look his father in the eye and in essence say, you're dead to me. Whoa, that is pretty amazing. Now, here's number two. Second thing we need to learn from the story of the prodigal son is what it meant for the son to feed pigs. We know in the story, he goes off to the far land. He goes off to... to uh, 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 party. He, he's going somewhere that mom and dad aren't around. Uh, they're not going to be calling him up, and uh, they're not going to be checking on him. Uh, it's not like, you know, Texas Tech, they, uh, uh, they have a place that they still have, apparently, uh, from what I've heard, because I have a daughter there. She says she's never been to this place. Uh, but uh, they have a club called the Library. And uh, uh, so that when your parents call and they can say, where were you last night? We couldn't get a hold of you. Uh, they can say, well, mom, dad, I was at the library, you know, the library kind of thing. So um, now that's, you know, Rebecca's not, she's a good girl. So um, and uh, anyway, so uh, but but he wanted to go somewhere where mom and dad couldn't call. And he wanted to go somewhere where nobody knew his name. So it's not, he's gonna, not going to wander into somebody and say, oh, you're old Frank's son. Why are you acting this way? You know, or you're Bob's uh, daughter, or whatever it may be. He wanted to go somewhere where no one would know his name, and he had all this money, so he would come in 
to the scene, if you will, and, and suddenly be the cool kid. Because he had more wealth than anyone his age, more than likely. And so he could throw lavish parties. And guess what? When you have money flowing around, you have drinks flowing around, you have food flowing around, and, and, and wine, women in song, or however you want to say it, guess what? Everybody's your friend. And they had great times, I'm sure. They probably had some bad hangovers. But he had friends, or so he thought. Because eventually, you keep throwing this wine, woman, and song kind of a thing, and it runs out, and the money's no more. And suddenly, you're left with nothing. He obviously did not go to his financial planner first. Instead, he went to the party. And when the party was over, everybody said, see ya. And so what situation does he find himself in? Well, he's, he, he has no money. He, he doesn't have a a way of paying for a hotel room. He, uh, he, he, he becomes desperate. There's a famine in the land, which makes things even worse. So everybody else around him is desperate as well. And he goes and does things that, that, that a good Jewish boy, and we assume Jesus is talking, uh, he's got Pharisees in the group, he's got uh, tax collectors, that, uh, Jewish tax collectors, things like that. He's, got, he, he's speaking to a primarily Jewish audience uh, that... Uh, that, that he's using a Jewish family as an example. And so for a good Jewish boy uh, to, to, to go and feed pigs was an extremely desperate situation. Now, why do we know this? Well, because pigs were unclean animals. In and the, and the Jewish law, uh, you, you didn't eat pork. You, uh, you know, bacon's out. Uh, I know, I don't, I, I don't know how they do that, but, uh, but bacon's out, um, and, uh, uh, and you, don't, you don't associate with pigs, you don't touch them, you don't get around them, or else you become unclean, uh, but guess what? He'd already broken one of the Ten Commandments uh, by dishonoring his father. Why not break another one, uh, or break another law, and, uh, and eat that which was unclean for his religion, or eat that, be around that, I should say, uh, that was which unclean for his religion. So that's what he did. He, uh, he began to, to work for this fella, probably getting absolutely nothing, maybe just working for room and board, uh, if at that, and uh, uh, feeding pigs. And he was, can you imagine what, how hungry you have to be to look at pig slop and, and think that looks delicious? That's where he was. That's how desperate he was. And so he begins to prepare his speech. He finally comes to his senses enough to prepare his speech. It's the hat in the hand, tail between the legs speech. That basically says, Dad, I messed up. I, I don't deserve to be treated as a son anymore. But can I at least be treated like a servant? Because he knew his dad was kind to his servants. And he knew his dad treated them well. And, and he hoped that he could have just a little bit of that uh, from his father. But he knew, he knew he didn't deserve it. He knew he didn't deserve it. So for a good Jewish boy to feed pigs, you had to be pretty desperate. That's number two. Let's look at number three. Here's a third thing you might not know about the story of the prodigal son, and that is what it meant for the father to run to meet his son. I imagine the, the father every day went out on the front porch and just looked at the road leading up to the house. And, and, and every morning, maybe he got up and had his cup of coffee or, or whatever they drank in the mornings back then. And, and he would always just uh, sit there and just kind of hope maybe his son would come walking up the path. And every evening before he went to bed, he'd sit in the cool of the breeze and he'd just sit, keep finding himself looking down that road, hoping that his son, he might see him again. Uh, and, and, uh, and then the day comes when he does. And what does he do? He runs. Now, to modern days, uh, we, we don't have a problem seeing somebody running. You know, if there's somebody running down your street and they've got on their, their jogging shorts and their T-shirt and they're running shoes and they're jogging, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. We think that's normal. That's okay. That's the way things, you know, they're getting exercise, you know. And then we start thinking about ourselves. Maybe I need to get exercise or, you know, that sort of thing. So we wouldn't be surprised. But what we need to know is that in the first century, Men didn't run. It was 
it was uh, unbecoming of a man to run. You know, they wore these long robes. Uh, and and uh, 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 to run in long robes is quite uncomfortable, uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, you could trip on those things. And so in order to run, you had to grab your robes and pull them up. And so your legs were free. Well, that's part of the, the, uh, 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 the, the issue, is that you didn't expose your legs in public in that way at that time. And so for, to see a father running down the street, they were, they were probably the people, the neighbors, and everybody were looking behind him and saying, is there a bear chasing this guy, you know, or, 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 or is he running from a fire, or, or somebody giving out gold, you know, you, we, you don't run. That's disrespectful, or, or that's, 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 uh, that's inappropriate for a man to, to, to not control himself in such a way that he would run. But guess what? The father didn't care. He didn't care what his neighbor said. He didn't care if he had a neighbor that, you know, the neighbor that looks through the blinds. Oh my gosh, Harvey! Harvey, the boy, the, Mr. Frankston's running! You know, he didn't care what they thought. He didn't care if the other men of the coffee group were going to make fun of him on Friday. He didn't care if, if, uh, uh, if he skinned his knees, because, you know, running in sandals certainly isn't going to be fun. And, and he, he didn't care if his wife was embarrassed and the women's group was going to get together that next week and, and they were going to talk about him running. He didn't care. Why? Because the son who was lost had become found. The son whom he loved, he loved more than the possibility of embarrassment. And that he didn't care what other people thought or said or did. That was his boy. He loved him and he ran. That is pretty amazing. Running is a big deal. But we may not have known that if we didn't understand the cultural context of the story. Here's number four. Number four is this. We need to understand who the real prodigal was. You know what the word prodigal means? You probably heard this story all your life, and you never knew what the word prodigal means. You thought, well, that was just some funky title they gave it. The word prodigal means excessive and lavish. And certainly, the boy lived in excessive ways and lavish ways. He spent all his money, wine, women, and song, and party. He had a great time until it all ran out. He was wasteful. He was extravagant. He was a prodigal. But here's the thing, even though we think the prodigal son was the true prodigal, and even though the, the publishers of Bibles will put headings on things such as mine where it says the parable of the prodigal son, guess what? He's not the real prodigal in this story. He really is not the biggest and real prodigal in this story. The person being even more lavish, the person being even more excessive, is not the son. It's the father. It's the father who, who gave it all to his son, even though his son wished him dead. It was the father who looked for his son every day. It's the father who ran in spite of being embarrassed, embarrassing himself doing so. It's the father who throws the great party for his son because he is so glad he has returned. It's the father that doesn't listen to a lick of his story with his hat in his hand and his tail between his legs because he's more concerned about the son returning. It's the father who just almost, I just imagine him tackling his son and giving him a big bear hug and a kiss and just saying, I'm so glad you're home. That's the prodigal. That's excessive. That's lavish. And that, my friends, is love. Excessive and lavish. I mean, think about it. How many fathers would have turned their backs on, on their ungrateful kid? How many fathers would have held a grudge, at least for a while? How many fathers would have, as soon as the kid came up, would have let him walk all the way to the front porch while they stood and watched him and said, I told you so. 
How many fathers would have not forgiven their son for being wasteful? How many fathers would have asked him to, or made him pay back the money that he wasted? How many fathers would have sat down and given him a lifelong speech about how terrible he's been and what a rotten, spoiled kid he is? But not the prodigal father. Not the prodigal father. He was lavish and excessive with love, with forgiveness. And with grace. Did the kid deserve it? Nope. But he gave it anyway. Here's number five. Who is the story really about? We think about the prodigal son. We make him the, the main point of the, of the story. But, but who is this story really about? Well, to understand that, we have to put this story in context. Uh, And the context of of Luke chapter 15 is that this is one of three stories that that basically follow the same pattern. The first story uh, is about the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep that he has within his, uh, you know, responsibility, whatever, in his pen or whatever, to discover because there's one sheep missing. He goes out and searches high and low to find that sheep. The second story is about the woman who has ten silver coins. And she loses one of those silver coins. And she, she cleans her house and searches for that coin tirelessly up and down all throughout her house. What these stories and the story of the prodigal son and father have in common is that they follow a very set pattern. Something is lost, a sheep, a coin, a son, Someone is looking for that which is lost, a shepherd, a woman, a father. That which is lost becomes that which is found. And in each case, they all throw a party. That's pretty cool. That which is lost, the sheep, the coin, and the son, are important to each story. But what these stories are really about is to to describe to us and the hearers the nature of God. And the nature of God's love for lost people. The nature of God, God's love for lost people. These stories are about a God who takes risks, about a God who is relentless, about a God who never gives up hope. No one is ever too far gone. It is the stories of the image of a loving God. So what do these stories tell us about God? Well, it tells us that he's relentless in pursuing the lost, that he never gives up on them, and he longs for people to come home. No matter how far off they've gone, no matter if they've gone around the block or off to the far country, whether they've been wasteful or just ignorant or just lazy or just uh, 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 lost into to whatever the world is trying to offer them, no one is too far gone for God. God's love is always extended to them. God calls us to love others in the same way. You know, the story of the prodigal uh, father is not unlike the father in another story. Pedro, the son, hated his father. And he had no qualms about letting his father know this. He would cuss him out. He, he would tell him that he's no good. He would tell him that you're worthless. I don't, I, I don't love you. I, I just want to leave. And, and eventually, Pedro did that. He, he turned 16 and, and decided he was man enough to go take care of himself. And so, so Pedro left his house, left his father, and uh, went to go make it on his own. As, as you might imagine, that didn't last too long because his friend's couches uh, would only allow them to stay there for so long and until the, the family said, no, they need to go. And, and after he ran out of friends' couches, he, he uh, tried to get some work, but he wasn't able to get work like, like he thought because he was so young. And, and so he ended up for at least a couple of years sleeping out on the streets and, and begging for food and, and collecting cans to try to turn them in for some money and, and things like that. And, and Pedro, kind of like the prodigal son in the story, uh, got desperate. And so one day, he, he decided, I, 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 need to, I need to go home. And so 
He spent the next several weeks collecting as many cans as he could and turning them in for coins. And, and over a period of time, he collected enough to, to, to buy a bus ticket uh, back to his home, but also to pay for a phone call. And that phone call came first, and he called and his, his, his dad's house, and, and uh, uh, the dad didn't answer the phone, uh, and he left a message on the machine. The message said this. It said, Dad, I'm sorry. I was wrong for treating you the way that I did. Uh, I see now that uh, you were trying to teach me, uh, and, and I see now how much you love me. Please forgive me. I'd like to come home. If you forgive me, please leave a light on in the window so that I'll know that it's okay for me to come in. Well, he, uh, uh, after he'd gotten enough money to get the ticket, uh, he boarded the bus and made his way on home. Dropped off at the downtown station. He walked through town, and it was night, and, and only the streetlights were on. But he knew where to go, and he, after a while, made it to his house. And as he came down and rounded the corner, he saw the most amazing sight. For you see, there wasn't just a candle in the window. Every single light in the house was on. The floodlights were on. There were candles all along the, the ledges of the, of the porch. There were, there were flashlights along the, the driveway. It lit up like the, the 4th of July. It, it looked like day in the, in the middle of the night. And there was Pedro's father to embrace him. This story can be taken home in a couple of different ways. If you are the son or daughter who's been in the far country, you need to know that you have a father waiting for you at home who loves you, a spiritual father, a heavenly father, who, who, who yeah, he knows everything you've done, and yet he still loves you and wants to forgive you and wants to receive you back. It's time. Quit making up speeches. Just repent and return to the open arms of God. The other person we could talk about in this story, uh, we could talk about the brother. That's a whole other sermon. We're not going to worry about him this morning. But, but the other one I want to talk about is the father. And that is who we're called to be. We are called to be loving, gracious, forgiving people. We are called to embrace lost boys and lost girls. We're called to forgive them. We're called to embrace them. We're called to love them. So I want to challenge you today. If you find yourself in the far country, come home. If you find yourself on the other side, be loving, be kind, and be gracious because this is how God has loved you. You bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us as the Father has in this story. Loved his Son. Thank you for receiving us when we have gotten lost, when we have lost our way, when we have been wasteful. But thank you for outdoing us in extravagance, by outdoing us in love. Thank you for your forgiveness and your grace that you give us every single day. Help us to in turn give that to others. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song this morning. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here. I find my Without you, I fall apart, cause you're the one that guides my heart. Oh, I need you, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, and every hour I Thank
Thank you for loving us. Would you receive now this benediction? Go forth in the power and strength that God gives you to be the children of God. Children who have been brought home by God's love. The children who give that love away to those in need. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in God's peace.